my endeavor today is going to be uh, giving you the philosophy of the curriculum that we are all following. Uh, if you don't understand the philosophy behind it, then you may not make sense uh, about the whole thing. And um, a lot of the churches that are doing this right now may not fully understand the curriculum. So let me uh, start with uh, a question that I'm placing to you all. Uh, and many of you know the answer who have already been my introductory sessions and who have already uh, listen to me before kindly do not answer but for those who have hearing it for the first time you may also know the answer but you know I'd like the new people to give me the answers for example um, uh, when was Jesus born what date was Jesus born tell me the answer September 11 September 11 okay which year probably 30 AD or something 30 AD Jesus was born before that Okay, somebody said 3 BC, uh, Elijah, okay. So let's go with uh, between 6 and 3 BC is an approximate time that Jesus was uh, born into the world. Uh, and then approximately which year did he uh, go to the cross, uh, was buried and rose again? Approximately which year would that be? I mean, the scholars were talking at different, different uh, dates, but I'm talking about approximate that you all need to know. 6 plus 33, right? Um, Elijah says 35 to 40 AD. If Jesus was born earlier than earlier than BC, I mean in the BCs, then he lived approximately 30, 35 years. Um, then, um, if you put in from uh, let's say an average of 5 BC, you put it, you, it will come to about 30 to 35 AD, approximately 30 to 35 AD. Rough. It's here. It's a plus or minus. We can go couple of years maybe but uh, approximately that is the range that we are looking at when was the first uh, letter in the uh, current in, in the canon in the scriptures that we have as we have it today uh, when was the first uh, when was the first uh, which is the date of the first new testament book was written yes anybody when was the first New Testament book written? Which was the book? When was it written? Okay, Elijah said 30 Thessalonians around 44 AD. Anybody else want to give a shot at it? The, which is the first book? And when was the first New Testament book written? Some of you may be theologians already in this, maybe also know the answers. Um, but people who have not attended my session are free to speak, even if they are theologians and they know the perfect answer. Or even if you are referring a, a, a study Bible right now, also no problem. But give me an answer. Hey, hello, everybody. Some response. I, I know the Gospels were written much later, but I think letters were letters of Paul were. Uh, the first things to start circulating. Galatians, so, hmm? Corinthians, Romans, what else? Hey, only one, I don't tell all of the books. <laughs> yeah, scholars say that from perhaps the first book to be written would have been Thessalonians or Galatians, not sure. There is a lot of disputes going on among the scholars. Some people say Mark was also one of the earliest books. So we uh, as far as this curriculum is concerned, we look at the Thessalonians as the first book and uh, approximately the time of writing would have been between 48 and 50, 48 and 50 AD. Okay, and um, uh, Paul was writing, any reason, any of you know why Paul wrote to the Thessalonians? Why Paul wrote the Thessalonian letter, anybody knows? Because he could not travel. Wonderful, wonderful, superb answer, okay, good. He could not travel. Maybe he was in jail. Uh, the Snowdens is not a prison epistle. Uh, false teaching, but there is a primary concern he had, and that kind of helps you to um, that kind of helps you to uh, figure the essence of that letter. Okay, now if the Snowdens was written around forty-eight, and uh, Jesus um, died, buried, and rose again somewhere in AD thirty-five let's say in and around, we have about 14 to 13 years to 15 years 
of time before any text came into the listening. But if you read Acts chapter 2, can you turn with me to Acts chapter 2? All of you turn your Bibles. Acts chapter 2. Which, uh, which year was uh, uh, Acts and Luke written? Luke and Acts are actually one book. It is written in two parts. Uh, which year was uh, uh, Luke Acts written? It, it has to be deep into Paul's imprisonment because that is included within the text. It, it has to be deep in the? It has to be deep, uh, like uh, it has to be much later or within the time where Paul is imprisoned and taken to Rome because that those content is included within the book of Acts. Exactly. So it would have been written, there is a, the range goes from 60 to 80. Between 60 to 80, the scholars are varying on this. But let's put an average about 70. So Luke is now writing backwards, looking at the records and history that has happened. He says in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. He says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Okay. So he was just kind of giving a summary of what the people who gathered together in the name of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, what they did. They were involved in the apostles' teachings. Now, what do you think was the apostles' teachings? What do you think was the apostles' teachings? Only the gospel, because they had only the Old Testament for their reference. Okay, so yeah, according to Arun, Arun says, and it's a very logical answer, um, he's a very logical boy actually and it says very clearly that he said that it is the only the Old Testament was available so the what the what was written by Luke when he said apostles teaching would have been the Old Testament but interestingly with all due respect to what Arun said and I uh, that, uh, that's a fantastic answer the the apostles teachings were not just the Old Testament because then uh, it would have been addressed differently uh, the apostles' teachings possibly included uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ, which Jesus has given interpreting the Old Testament and giving practical uh, applications of the law and everything that Jesus spoke we know in the Gospels. Uh, it, it, it was the uh, apostles had received it and were teaching the new community that is formed. Okay, so it was not just the Old Testament, it was the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, how do you, where do you get evidence for this? Anybody wants to tell? Where do you get evidence that this is probably what, what we are talking here is, what I'm telling you is possibly, and uh, uh, it's a possibility. Let me repeat the question. That the apostles' teachings basically is a curriculum that the apostles taught the new community and that content included the teachings of Jesus Christ. There are some clues in the New Testament to make us believe this very clearly. So one way to think about this would be the apostles. Uh, the apostles are coming from the group that Jesus taught. And Jesus had a new teaching apart from the Old Testament. So apart from the Old Testament, he was bringing the new kingdom. He was explaining new things. And that is why entering into his community, people were getting baptized and they had to learn a new set of ideas which is what the apostles are continuing. So they're teaching what Jesus has taught. So that has good. to be something separate from the Old Testament. Good, good. But if you, I mean, uh, uh, going along with what Elijah and uh, Arun uh, just told, if you would turn with me to the road to Emos. Road to Emos, anybody knows where road to Emos is? Anybody can get me that passage, road to, the road to Emos? I think it's in... Uh, Luke 24, 39. Uh, Luke 24. Let's go there. Luke 24. 13. Okay. Now let's look at the road to Emos. Um, so these two guys were walking along and they apparently were disciples and Jesus joined them. And uh, then uh, <clears throat> yeah, let's read that passage from 24 verse 13 onwards. That very day, two of them were going into a village named Emos, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is the, this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. 
Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened the, there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, uh, in word and uh, before God and all the people. Now these guys are Jews, and for them Jesus was like uh, one of those prophets, you know, who you who are there in the uh, post-exilic, uh, exilic, uh, the divided kingdom, the kingdom time. There were uh, prophets all through, from Samuel onwards. You see prophets coming in big time, and all those prophets. And Jesus was one of them probably because he did amazing things. For for the Jew, that was the way he looked at it. And there were 400 years there were no prophets, and suddenly you had John, and then you had Jesus. So he's talking in that angle. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And that was a political statement because it was pure politics there. They all looked to a Messiah who would deliver them from? From Rome. From Rome. So it is a political statement actually. Nobody understood the Messiah. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when the city did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even uh, seen... Um, when they did not find his body, they came back uh, saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. The first announcement of Easter, okay? And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So what is Jesus saying now? Hey guys, you guys have not believed what the Old Testament said. Was it necessary for that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Can you see a curriculum there? He takes the Old Testament, just like Arun said, and he pulls it out and shows how the Messiah fulfilled uh, the Messianic prophecies that was there in the Old Testament. And if you were there in the Good Friday service yesterday, I had spoken to you about how the gospel is there in the old and the new and how beautifully God has planned this out. So Jesus actually expounded the Old Testament. Apart from that, he also gave a lot of practical applications of the law through parables and through different uh, things. But there was, like Elijah said, a, a, a new set of teachings for the community. Okay, A new set of teachings for the community. But that had its roots also in the Old Testament. For example, our communion, our communion table. We know that uh, though Jesus was celebrating the communion when, at the Passover as he was uh, doing it the first time he did it, it has its uh, type in the Passover uh, where uh, death was uh, death passed by without affecting the man who put their trust in the blood of the lamb, which is the same situation for us today. And we do communion to remember the death, burial, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the proclamation of the gospel. We, we do that. Uh, so there is a similarity between the thing. But then now the communion itself has a new uh, understanding now that Christ has come. So the teachings, definitely, like Elijah said, there is a, there is a new, new additions to the curriculum that is there. So the apostles' teaching included this new curriculum, which now taught the community from the Old Testament that the Messiah has come and fulfilled and new instructions were given for community life. New instructions were given for community life because Jesus fulfilled all of the ceremonial laws. Jesus fulfilled many of those uh, things and many of the civic laws did not apply at that time because the nation of Israel was under uh, oppression by another uh, government. So most of the moral laws still hold good in the New Testament. The most of the ceremonial laws have as sacrificial laws were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So there was a new set of guide, guidelines for the community to learn. So uh, between uh, the uh, death, burial and resurrection of Jesus and before the first text, probably Thessalonians was written in 48 is the, there was a period of time that the apostles of Jesus Christ taught the teachings of Christ, taught the teachings of Christ to the new community of believers. And that was the apostles' teaching. 
that was the apostles teaching and that body of knowledge that was there or content that the apostles taught some people wrote it down some people learned it by heart and that body of knowledge remained and most of it is lost but some of it were uh, most of it were captured in the new testament apostolic writings most of it were captured in the new testament apostolic writings so that's that's the most important thing so in the epistles of written by paul uh, we see or we capture a lot of those teachings that the apostles taught to that first century new community that was formed those who have believed in the lord jesus christ and now have, now the question came uh, do we have to have circumcision because the, the 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 people from which whom the gospel the messiah came was from uh, the jewish background and the jews had circumcision there was a, so that now the rule has changed the the, the 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 teaching has changed on circumcision and you can see the whole book of galatians dedicated to give, understanding the freedom that we have in christ and that we do not need to go back into the um, the jewish uh, laws that the nation of israel actually followed so now i want all of us to understand that the apostles had a curriculum that they taught uh, the community the apostles had a clear curriculum that they taught the community to establish them in the gospel to establish them in the gospel and the gospel is the word that was used at that time was called the kerygma k e r y g m a kerygma and that was basically the proclamation that the apostles made to the people for, for in the preaching of the gospel so uh, people heard the kerygma people understood people responded to it people then were led to water baptism and then they were taught to be established in the gospel that means that there was a new belief that you had now there is something so you 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 are worshiping idols before now you have come into uh, a relationship with jesus and now you have a new belief so the apostles were very clear that you understand the gospel and not only to be established in the gospel they also wanted you to not just have a new belief but you they wanted you to have a new behavior there is a mandatory new behavior that the community must have can i hear an amen to that i mean everybody are you all able to get it yes amen amen yes so it was so most of uh, even christianity today the stress is on uh, a new uh, faith a new belief but there is very little stress on a new practice or new behavior the only behavior the church asks for today is come on time to church give your tithe and offering lift your hands and worship god if you do all these things the pastor will love you say amen nobody saying amen but amen. the apostles the apostles were uh, very clear that that there there is to be a behavior there has to be a change in the way of life of the person who has now heard the gospel who has believed in the gospel and have decided to join this community of people who live the gospel so i want you to turn with me to matthew matthew 28 matthew 28 and verse um, and an earth has been given to me go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father son and the holy spirit teaching them to observe all things that i have commanded you and behold i am with you always to the ends of the age so there is a delegation that he is saying now hey guys i did this till now but i am going i have a new ministry i am handing over this ministry to you guys i am backing you completely as you go and do this ministry so the delegation of authority is given there second thing he tells the commission what are you supposed to do what are we supposed to do can you tell me uh it is to make go and preach and make disciples uh to all the uh, and to baptize them in the name of father son and the holy spirit Fantastic. and to teach and teach them to observe all that i have commanded to you mm -hmm. so whoever is going to become a new disciple they also have to follow the same 
uh, process again. They will have to go and uh, preach and then make disciples and then baptize them again. That's it. Thank you, uh, sister. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Which part of the Great Commission that are we fulfilling right now in our churches? Which part of the Great Commission are we fulfilling in our churches? Go to the nations. Yes, Arun? Go to the nations. That's all. Full stop. Amen. Arun, you hit it right head of the nail, okay? I hope that we were at least going to the nations. At least, yes. So, the church has been good at uh, maybe reaching out because in a city like Bangalore, the nations are all around us. To some extent, we were able to reach out to them. Once we preach the gospel to them and they get saved, you make a sinner's prayer, then you bring them to church and we are all happy. We are all very happy. We have one new soul added to the, the church. Get baptized whenever you want. It's okay. We are understanding, you know, we can, we can, we can hang around in that area. It's okay. But you're coming to church. You are now coming on church on time. You are taking part in the ministry. You are giving time to the church. We are happy with you. Please keep coming to church. Please come to New Life Fellowship Whitefield only. But what does the commission say? The commission says, go to the nations, preach the gospel, and those who believe you need to baptize them. And once you're baptized, now you're part of the community. The community now, which is the church, has the obligation as per the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ that you must teach them. Teach what? The curriculum is there mentioned very clearly in the commission. We cannot teach anything. We have to teach what the commission says. All that Jesus commanded the disciples. Perfect. So is it Old Testament? No, New Testament. It is. There is the concept of old and new will suddenly disappear when you see the whole plan of God. That Jesus definitely spoke about the New Old Testament, but Jesus interpreted it, gave practical applications for the new community, took away what was not required, what was fulfilled, but all of it, in essence, remained the same, but Jesus interpreted it for us. Jesus fulfilled it for us, and Jesus gave us a new curriculum. And that curriculum is what we are supposed to, as the delegated authority right now on earth, the church is supposed to teach the people who come into the community. Am I? Are you all in agreement with me? Yes or no? Do you all agree with me? Yes. I disagree still. You know why? Because even now, the Great Commission is not fulfilled. You have preached the gospel. You have um, baptized him. You brought him to the church. You have, you have, you have taught him the, the curriculum that Jesus told. Do you think the Great Commission is fulfilled? Without teaching, it won't be fulfilled. It can't be fulfilled. And make this. Perfect. Now the teaching is also done. Do you think the Great Commission Make is good? Make when Jesus, comes, when yes. Jesus comes back, we continue the Great Commission. The Great Commission Make is still not fulfilled. You, bought a, you just take the situation. Imagine uh, Angel is an unbeliever. You preach the gospel to Angel. It's very difficult to preach gospel to angels. But anyway, we preach the gospel to this Angel. Angel received a lot. Angel got baptized. We brought Angel to the church. And uh, then uh, Pastor Coffee started a Bible study. Pastor Coffee taught her all that Jesus taught her. Do you think the Great Commission is fulfilled? They have to make new disciples. You have to keep going. Uh -huh. I'm happy you're all thinking. Huh? Now, Angel should start making disciples. Fantastic. Good. Okay. But I still, that's not the answer. Read, read the Great Commission. It is there in the text. Your answer is in the text. 
we have to assure the people that they can do this because god is there with everyone to the end of the age fantastic the great commission is still not over because the text says very clearly where what is the end point of the commission we have taken a sample mm -hmm. korean sister what did you say observe observe exactly now the great commission would be fulfilled in the life of angel only when pastor coffee and the church ability to angel to obey angel starts to obey all that are you able to see it so this teaching we are talking about is not just having a bible study and leaving it there this teaching is about seeing to seeing to it that now angel was in the world had a lifestyle lived in a particular way now she is part of the community and now the new community is uh, loving her taking care of her nourishing her teaching her and then encouraging her to practice all that she has been taught until that happens and the angel's life starts to change in alignment with the teachings of jesus christ the great commission is not fulfilled is that is that a paradigm change for us but isn't it a lifelong process it is it is it is but are we intentional about it that to see that i need to see now angel's life change as now she has come to our church and she is put under our care it is the responsibility of us elders to see that her life now changes in alignment with the teachings it is not that we fulfill a curriculum but it is more than fulfilling a curriculum it is a matter of behavior it's a matter of life it's a matter of how we are going to live our lives are we able to see the great commission for example uh, till some time back for me my great commission was preach the good news and i preached and preached and preached many people got saved what i did was i put them into the, how many of you got to, gone to uh, mcdonalds uh, at least before lockdown anybody mcdonalds now oh, everybody is mcdonalds i love mcdonalds okay the great maharaja i like okay now uh, when you go there is something new that they've got i think once i think elijah and us were at mcdonalds and we ordered uh, i'm not sure who i was with one of the whitefield people because i was there at that uh, itpl there is a mcdonalds there and we had there and they i wanted to try this something new this peri peri uh, french fries have you seen that you drop the so they gave me the cover and the french fries and i am like i don't know what to do with this and they, and they gave one small sachet so they put open the cover put the sachet of uh, um, spices inside then they put the um, inside and they did one shaking like this so what we the great commission what we all did was got people saved and like the fries put them into the church we put some masala and every sunday we did one shaking till we all became very very, very masala but that was not the great commission the great commission was intentional in life change practice of the teachings of jesus christ that is the philosophy of our curriculum that we are starting now um, if we got this much clear the next thing is um, to kind of figure out uh, what the apostles taught and uh, what was the focus of their their uh, teachings so what this this particular author uh, did was his name is jeff reed i think you all have the books with you how many of you have the books with you can i all see your books where your books it's a book wave time okay many of you are going for the books okay i can see angel now walking towards the all right now there are three books that this person has brought out it's a series it's a, okay this is series 1 series 
and series three. If you look at series one, it has got four booklets inside. You can see on the surface, on the outside, the first book booklet is called Becoming a Disciple. Becoming a Disciple. The second booklet is called Belonging to a Family of Families. The third is Participating in the Mission of the Church. And fourth is Cultivating Habits of the Heart. This is your first book. And uh, it is the first series and with four books inside. The second book has got um, important aspects. Uh, enjoying your relationship, marriage, passing on your beliefs. How do you bring up children? Envisioning a fruitful life work. How do you manage your career, uh, uh, work, work life, building for future generations? How do you invest? How do you invest, invest, invest it? Then your third series, which is primarily focused on ministry, is about handling the word of God with confidence. Handling the word of God with confidence. Second, unfolding the Great Commission. Unfolding the Great Commission. This is pure ministry. This goes takes you very deep into ministry. Unfolding the Great Commission is about the book of Acts. Then you have laying the solid foundations of the gospel which is going to be the book of Thessalonians. Then you have catching God's vision for the church, which is going to be the book of Ephesians and living in God's household, which is going to be basically leadership studies uh, focused on the pastoral epistles of first and second Timothy and Titus. Uh, so when you finish these three books, what you would have is uh, an absolutely completely different life that's the heart of it you would have completely a different life in other words what Jeffrey has done is over 30 years of research and studies himself in the context of a church and along with discussions with very very top level uh, theologians he kind of worked with the apostolic writings and pulled out what was the essence of uh, of what the apostles taught the uh, first century church. I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. And if you would go with me to uh, verse 19. Uh, Ephesians, verse 19. I'm just going to make a point here. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, which is the church. And the church is built, is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The cornerstone being Christ himself. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So what is the church built upon? What is the church built upon? The cornerstone, which is Christ, it is the cornerstone is the main and the most important part of the foundation from which every reference is taken. And then the foundation is built up. And the foundation is built by the apostles and the prophets, basically the teachings, the teachings. So the church is built upon Christ and the apostles' teachings. So we go on to say, as Jeff Reed always says, the way of Christ and the apostles. The way of Christ and the apostles. That's the common terminology among people who use this curriculum. We are looking at the way of Christ and the apostles. So um, with this, uh, with, with this three curriculum, you will, uh, will have your uh, foundations established in the apostles' teachings. That's the uh, the essence of the curriculum. So now I want to take you through uh, book by book uh, in the logic of how the curriculum is placed. You need to, uh, there is a way that this man has written the curriculum, okay? It is progressive. The whole thing is progressive. I want to show you that the original content was not written in three, uh, the original content was not written in uh, three books. It was written in uh, so many small booklets. Okay, so many booklets are there, so many of them. Okay, but now it is brought down in three books. So they combined it together and formed three books. 
uh, what I showed you was the old version. Today they have come out with a newer version, which I think many of you would have got this version. So now I'm going to take, uh, uh, let me just show it to you again. This is your, this is the old version of the books, the old version. Some of you have this, some of you have the new version of the books, new version of the books. Okay. And the original book was written actually not as three books, but as a huge collection of small booklets. Okay. So uh, I'm just showing you all this for information. Um, the curriculum doesn't stop with these first three books. Okay, the curriculum actually goes. Uh, you have uh, from Jesus to the Gospels, and then you have Matthew, you have Mark, you have Luke, Acts, you have John. So if you finish the first principles three books, you would have primarily finished all of the apostolic writings in the epistles. Then you can go to Jesus and the Gospels and finish all the five books. That would completely finish you with the, uh, the, uh, the New Testament completely. And then you could look at doing the Old Testament through a wonderful book this curriculum has brought called The Story. So beautifully, it will explain to you the Old Testament. So when you have finished these three books and then finished all of these books, the Gospels, and finished this, the story, you would have finished the Bible completely with such in-depth understanding, practical, life-changing understanding of what the Bible is speaking about. But for now, we are only looking at book number one. Book number one. This is your foundations. Okay. So uh, let me give you the logic of the book. Let me give you the logic of the book. Okay. Why do we call it first principles? Why do we call it first principles? I want you to turn with me to Colossians, the book of Colossians. Yeah. Are you all in Colossians chapter two? I'm going to read from verse 1 onwards. Read from chapter, Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, the gospel, the kerigma, okay? In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. See, the apostle is writing very clearly here that he has a clear target in terms of what he wants to do by writing the letters, meeting with them and teaching them that they must, be, have, they must have a good order and firmness in their faith in Christ. Okay, it's very clear there for us in what they have written. He also indicates there that there is a lot of wrong teachings that are going around and we should not be caught away with that. Therefore, they must be grounded properly in the understanding of Christ. That is the essence of that passage we read. Now going to verse number six. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, that means you have received the gospel, you understood the kerygma, so walk in him. Now, is not, you know, putting hands on Jesus and walking. That walking is not what we're talking about. What is he saying there? He's saying, you heard the gospel. You have understood the gospel. Now leave, leave the gospel. That's the message that he's trying to tell there. You need to walk in him. Walk in the gospel. How do you do that? Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, 
just as you are taught. Can you believe that? Apostle Paul is fulfilling the Great Commission. Can you see that here? We talked about the Great Commission fulfillment, right? That you preach the gospel and then teach the people that they will obey. Look at the stress that Apostle Paul is putting here. He says that now that you have received Christ, I want you to walk in him. How do you do that? Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you were taught. That gives us all the basis why we are doing this curriculum. Abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to the human tradition, according to the elemental principles of the world and not according to Christ. So the argument that Apostle Paul is saying is that you have believed in the gospel. I want you to now practice it. How will you practice it? I want you to be rooted in it. What is the meaning of rooted in it? That means all your behavior, your attitudes, everything come out of what I am teaching you. The root of your attitude and behavior should be in the gospel. That's what he's saying. Okay? It should be in the gospel. And that will establish you in the gospel, just as you were taught. And how does the apostle do this? By teaching them and encouraging them to obey that. Okay? Then he says, then the next problem he brings is, but see to it that no one will take you with some funny teachings, crazy teachings, empty teachings, with a lot of uh, gas, there's nothing the truth in it. There can be a lot of stuff that is coming to you. And there are human traditions that can be brought into you. And all of these empty, deceitful teachings with uh, plausible arguments are all, and even human traditions, are all first principles of the world. Elemental spirits of the world is basically, it's the other word that is used there is first principles of the world. But rather, you and me should be taken captive by the first principles of Christ. That's what he's saying. And not, and not according to Christ. That means according to, you have to say, apply the same thing there, the first principles of Christ, as it was considered in the first part of the uh, verse. So the concept of the first principles, uh, Jeff Reed is taking from this chapter where he, he, he's uh, uh, seeing Paul actually encourage the Colossian believers to not just hear the gospel and believe and baptize and become part of the community, but to walk, walk in the gospel, walk in, and that how do you do that? Your, your actions, behaviors, everything should be rooted in the gospel. That means, you know, uh, as Christ forgave me, I need to forgive others. I need not hold bitterness in my heart. I do not need to react and respond out of bitterness because Christ has forgiven me. Christ has forgiven me. Therefore, I have the power to forgive somebody. I'm giving you applications of understanding how you are rooted in the, in the gospel and how you are built up. It's not just there. You keep growing your faith. Uh, Apostle uh, Paul writes to them, you know, contend for your faith and see that you grow in your faith in, in, in Titus, he teaches. So here, um, and, but he says that there are wrong teachings in the world wrong teachings and those first principles of the world it can you 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 can be easily pulled into those things but you must be established in the first principles of Christ so that is the uh, the root uh, the the key verse that he uses from where he took the word first principles but you can also see that in hebrews chapter 5 if you turn with me to hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11 turn with me to hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11 my dear brothers and sisters, I want you to know one thing. As you listen to me speak today, please don't think that all this wonderful revelation came to me, okay? I am absolutely none, nothing I'm teaching is by my own revelation that God gave me. I was taught by somebody, okay? I was taught by somebody and I have understood it and I am now teaching. So I have, this is not super revelation by Apostle Pastor George, nothing. I am just like you, a student who just, uh, I am maybe in fifth standard, you are in uh, second standard or third standard. That is all the difference it is, okay? Now, uh, if you come to, uh, keep it, keep your page in Hebrews chapter 5, but come to uh, 1 Timothy, 
I'm sorry, second Timothy. Are you on second Timothy? Go to second Timothy chapter two, uh, verse two. So always remember two Timothy two, two. That's a very key verse for you, okay? Two Timothy two, two. So what does uh, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 say? It says a very beautiful statement. Uh, you then, my child, be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard me in the presence of many witnesses, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay. So look at the look at this verse. Okay, it's a very interesting verse, and I want you to capture the essence of it. It's very key. He says, "You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ." How can you strengthen? How can Timothy be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ? It is not some you know some feelings and things like that. It is very simple. He says, "I taught you something, Timothy. Timothy, I taught you something. That is where you are rooted in the gospel." And I, you are rooted in the gospel. That is how you grow in the grace of Christ, built in your holy faith. Okay. So uh, sometimes when we read some of these verses, we are thinking of some nice feelings and some goosebumps and all that. Nothing. Okay. It is all about learning and studying. Okay. It is not that I need to wait upon God and suddenly new revelation strikes me. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 yeah I got new revelation. No, it's not that. It's very simple. What did uh, uh, Apostle Paul get? Paul got, Paul said, I received from the Lord. But we are not in first century, and that is the apostolic times. Uh, Paul got it from uh, Apostle Peter. Uh, he went to Jerusalem many times. He sat with the apostles. He understood. He heard. And he, uh, Paul had revelations that he had when he listened to what Jesus has taught. He also got from somebody else. He said, I received what I received. I'm giving it to you. Okay, now here Apostle says, I received it, and Timothy, I'm giving it to you. I want you to grow in the grace of Christ Jesus. And I as I'm giving it to you, remember I've done this in the in the in the in the, in the company of a lot of people. You were trained along with many people. You are there are witnesses who saw that you were taught by me, and I want you to teach faithful men who will teach others also. Can you see that? So what was the what was that teaching? What was the teaching? It seems to be a clear curriculum, isn't it? There seems to be some content that is being transferred from generation spiritual generation to spiritual spiritual generation. Am I correct? Can, I, can you all agree with me on this? Yes. Yes. At least show me hand. Yes. Yes. Show me hand. Show me hand. Okay. Good. Okay. You all agree with me? Show me a hand. Fantastic. Okay. So we are clear there is content. We saw Apostle Paul saying that as you were taught, uh, we talked about the first principles of the world and the first principles of Christ. Now you come to Hebrews chapter 5. And it says in Hebrews chapter 5. And I'm reading from uh, verse 11 onwards. About this, we have much to say. And it is hard. I'm repeating, I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 onwards. Okay. About this, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain. Since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. So, you know, it looks like. Who is writing the book of Hebrews? We don't know. Some people say Paul. Some people say uh, Apollos. The different uh, the names are there. But we don't know. But seems to be very very scholarly. Have a very deep understanding of uh, Old Testament. Probably from a Jewish background. Because nobody can write this as good as it. Paul has the, all the qualifications. But the writing style is totally different. So we don't know the author of the, uh, Hebrews. But the person is a very, very... A uh, senior man in leadership for sure, because the understanding of revelation this man has is amazing. Uh, so he says to the people who he is addressing, the Hebrews, namely the Jewish believers, 
he says by now you should have been what teachers, teachers. teachers. Yes. so what's the goal of all teaching make new teachers you are making disciples but those disciples also have to be teachers most of us have been students for our lifetime never taught in our lives to anybody the gospel or the teachings of the apostle uh, teachings of the apostles we never ever involved ourselves in teaching every sunday we go and receive 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 but the the gospel in in, in its framework is a is a message and it has to be given and not only given it has to be taught so the goal of it is that you should become teachers in as first timothy in second timothy 2:2 2, 2, he says to uh, i'm going to rephrase it for you uh, apostle paul is saying hey timothy i taught you now that i have taught you i have made you a teacher can you go and teach someone else and those whom you teach will also become teachers and teach someone else what's the goal of all of our teaching the goal of our teaching is that always we should they, our students should remain students right so i feel good oh feels good feels good feels good yes i have my uh, you know disciples no that's not that's not the case that's not the way bible works okay so apostle paul say, i mean i i think it's apostle paul so i'm saying it he says by uh, about this we have much to say it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing that means they were not listening to what the uh, apostles were teaching for though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again what again the basic principles of the oracles of god the first principle so you see the concept of first principles was there if you read 6:1 uh, okay let's see what the first principles says you need milk not solid food for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child but the solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained to by constant practice to distinguish good good from evil therefore let us leave the elementary doctrines again you see the concept of first principles okay so from all these verses you see that there is content Like this is multi-chain evangelism. Oh, wonderful! Yes, super good concept, brother. Develop it, develop it. Okay, so <clears throat> you see that there is content, and apostles were very clear. The curriculum was there, and the apostles expected this curriculum to be transferred from one spiritual. About change in life and behavior, that is how Jesus said you should be salt. and light how can you be salt and light unless you are different if you are just like the world it doesn't make any difference you cannot make any change in the world you are different in the practice of the apostles teaching you are different because you practice the teachings of the lord jesus christ the great commission is fulfilled because now you are being taught to obey and therefore as you obey you are walking in christ you are now rooted and built up in the most holy faith that is what we are trying to do when we teach the first principles so all of you on this board i am seeing now there is a close to about a, a dozen of you more maybe a, a 15 of you at least 5 10 20 of you here all 20 of you are going to be what teachers teachers can you say i am going to be a teacher excellent for those who cannot i cannot see okay like paul said i wish i could see you anyway uh, but uh, before you become teacher there is one more stage before you become teacher one more stage what is that stage called i call it the stage of the practitioner the stage of the is not there in the text okay this is my understanding and learning as i went through this you are taught so you have a stage of being a student then you become an a, a practitioner and once you are a practitioner you start to again teach so you are a student or an apprentice then you become a practitioner and then you become a teacher all of you 20 of you or 25 of you that are there on this you are all to learn this curriculum 
practice it you may not do all of it immediately but you will start working it your life is starting to change and then from there you start to go and teach somebody now who will you teach please don't go to pastor coffee and say pastor coffee give me somebody to teach you will put pastor coffee in trouble pastor coffee will call me and tell me pastor you please don't tell all these things now everybody is calling me and telling me give me somebody to teach that's not how it works go preach the gospel what are you supposed to do go preach the gospel those who believe baptize them bring them into the community of the church bring them into the authority of the elders and then you spend your time invest your time teaching them the apostles teachings why do you want to teach them the apostles teachings why because pastor george told you i give you a simple reason if you love me you will do then where do you read that if you love me you will obey my commandments where did you read that which chapter was that which was which book john 1415 john 1415 excellent jesus says if you love me you will keep my commandments isn't it now was the great commission a commandment or a suggestion jesus was like uh, guys i got a good idea why don't you consider preaching the good news and perhaps it's a good idea if you baptize them and you know possibly possibly try and teach them if they teach if they learn fantastic praise the lord otherwise nothing else was that the gospel what was the great commission there was not a great commission the great commission was a command and jesus says if you love me obey my commandments you will keep my commandments so the whole the heart of preaching the gospel of baptizing and then teaching people to obey all that jesus taught at the heart of it you will do it if you are in love with jesus and you want somebody to experience in experience christ you you will uh, you will you will you know paul says you may have many teachers but very few will but i am a father to you i have begotten you in the gospel so when you have spiritual children you want those children to grow in the faith grow in the truth grow in grace and that you do by teaching them so please don't go to pastor coffee and eat his brains i am already eating up it a lot in the morning we had a 3 hour meeting i think his brain was all eaten please don't go and ask him for people you go preach the gospel you go preach the gospel and you will have fish plenty of fish you are all like peter we all are like peter we say to p jesus uh, no i i have been fishing all night no fish now we stop fishing we have retired from fishing isn't it because nothing nobody has come to jesus till now so just like uh, apostle peter we say i closed fishing uh, jesus i am not interested but you know what if when jesus is telling you now go and drop the net on this side of the other side and i'm guaranteeing you there is fish okay so when you get fish you need know you need to know how to uh, catch it you know uh, descale it fry it and all that stuff you need to know all of that is what we are talking about here but for that first you yourself need to know the first principles of christ first principles of christ now i'm going to go into the book okay i'm going to go into the book i want you to turn with me to the chapter becoming a disciple uh, the book becoming a disciple and in that the first chapter is the gospel i think many of you would have already done it so uh, i'm not going to go into the content of it but i'm going to teach you uh, uh, i'm going to give you the framework and the philosophy of how the lesson plan is put okay i'm going to teach you because all of you need to do this all of you need there was a clear intention the clear intention with how the curriculum was made and you need to understand that philosophy and implement it the same way otherwise you won't get the results you will not be able to get the results that we are supposed to go okay 
So you see the, uh, you have the old book or the new book? You have the old book or can I all see your books? Can I see your books, please? Okay, old, 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 old. Okay, all of you have this one, so it's fine. So you go to page number 19, 19. Are you all on page number 19? Can you say this? Yes, yes. Are you all on page 19? If you're on page 19, yes, say hi to me, yes. Okay, all right, page 19. So you see the lesson one, the gospel message. And you know what, first time when I came to, so before I introduced this curriculum to church, before I brought the first principles into church, about one and a half years, I studied it myself. About one and a half years, I studied the curriculum myself to see what it was like. I was convinced this is what the church needs. And then I brought it into the this thing. So I, over the years, now it's almost uh, two and a half, three years that I'm teaching and studying and teaching and studying this. So for me, please don't look at me, the flow that I have, I am now three, four years immersed in it. And I'm studying with, I'm studying with a set of pastors actually, okay? I'm studying with a set of very senior people and we all literally tear each other apart. They're not new life pastors. We are from different denominations and different this thing. We tear each other apart. We love learn so my my understanding of it is uh, a little more deeper uh, and also i am currently uh, with many of them here i am already uh, i have uh, i am doing a uh, i am doing a curriculum um, uh, there are so many books on my table i will die any minute okay see a lot of curriculum like this this is the next level this is the mn program okay this is the mn program we are part of the MN team. Many of us in this two group are also part of the MN team. So we have books there uh, that again takes us deeper. The same concepts, we are diving deep. And now I just, yesterday got my admission to Demon and we have to learn the paradigm papers, okay? So because I'm going in deep dive, I'm in deep dive, I have, I have a flow and I have an understanding of this and I've been every day hearing this, talking this, studying this. So please don't compare yourself with me. I'm, I'm in fifth standard. You can take double promotion, triple promotion. I'm very happy that is possible, but this is not possible because of the process is student, practitioner, and then become teacher, okay? But this process is I'm always a student. I'm always practicing. I'm always teaching. The process will continue for a life long, okay? So I want you to go to the first chapter and there is an introduction for you. Simple introduction he gives. And the next important part and the critical part is the, is the uh, passage of scripture that he has placed there. And all of you can see Acts 10, uh, 34 to 48. And that passage is taken by Jeff Reed according to what he thinks should be ideal for this chapter of gospel. Now, um, that can need not be. See, we don't need to agree everything with what Jeff Reed says, okay? We don't need to agree with Jeff Reed. If you, if you Google Jeff Reed and build, you will get two or three sites that will speak some nonsense about it. But uh, I'm convinced if it was nonsense, there would be at least a billion sites where people have written negative. Everybody, if you write Dr. George and also, you will find somebody written nonsense about me. So that doesn't matter. When you see the number of sites that are negative, you can understand how if the material has got any uh, criticality in it. And whoever has written some nonsense about Bild and uh, Jeff Reed, just below the nonsense in the blog itself, there are people who have countered them very clear of which one is me, okay? So um, now that uh, we have come to these things, so we don't need to agree everything with uh, Jeff Reed. Jeff Reed is also a human being. He's not uh, Jesus or God. He has done an excellent job. What I like about the curriculum is the framework, the framework he has created. And secondly, the intention with which he works, the framework, the intention with which he works. And thirdly, I like it because it is church-based theology. Church-based theology. How many of you understand what is church-based theology? Okay, I'm going to explain that to you. One minute, hold on. Okay, I'm going to show you church-based theology, okay? Uh, sorry. Can you see this? What do you see? Somebody tell me. I, don't, I want to know what you are seeing. Yellow box. Yeah, All right. right background. 
that's community. And there you have the church. And at the corner there you have the, what do you have there? Bible school. Bible college, Bible college. Now, the graduates of Bible college become ministers. And the ministers are appointed by the church and possibly the church will go to the community. Sometimes the, the, this last bridge is not happening, okay? Very few people go to the community. So this is the current scenario of how uh, Christian uh, education works. But let's look at another one. You have community. You have the church inside the community being the salt. And then you have the Bible college inside the, inside the church, inside the church. Which do you think is better? The previous concept or this concept? This concept. Why? Why do you think this is better? Uh, everything is connected in this. Because you like my picture? <laughs> no, no, everything is connected in this. What's wrong I mean, with, what is wrong with the previous version? Uh, so it was, it seemed like they were all uh, working in their own areas. Here it is. Brilliant, brilliant. So imagine you send a guy to study the gospel in a seminary, in a place far away. He's in a, in a small group, so doing academic, going to the library, writing articles, writing bibliography, referring books, writing examinations. And he has now become, um, after graduation, he says, I want to be campus placed. So one church comes and recruits him. And then he becomes, uh, one second, let me just take this stop share. Okay. And then he becomes uh, a pastor of the church. And uh, he's like, whatever he studied in his books and in the articles, He's just not able to relate it to what to do in the church. He doesn't know, have any idea. So one, why, why I remember one pastor said to me like this, okay? A very nice man, brilliant man, well-qualified theologian. Uh, I, has, I was once having a conversation with him. Uh, pastor, how do you, uh, he's a young man. He was not a very senior man, very young man. I said, Pastor, how do you prepare for your Sunday message? Because every Sunday message, he used to say, I, 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 I you know, I, got, I was still 12 o'clock in the night. I did not have anything. And suddenly I got this revelation. I said, fantastic. So I asked, uh, how did you, uh, can, I, can you just give me one minute, sir? didn't say call that's why so uh, what was it talking to you can you just give me a recollection yeah we were talking about this young uh, pastor and I asked the pastor pastor um, uh, how do you prepare for a Sunday service oh so he gave me this brilliant answer and uh, he said to me pastor you know it's so difficult Sunday after Sunday I have to preach so what happens when I was studying in uh, Bible college every time because there are a lot of teachers and preachers coming to teach them. So what he used to do, every time somebody came, he would give his laptop. He would give his laptop. So the preacher would always have to put the PPT into his laptop. So over four or five years, he collected lots of PPTs. So sun, uh, on Saturday night, he will do eeny, meeny, miny, moo. And he will pick up a message. And he will put it into the microwave, heat it up and then serve it on Sunday. You see, the, you see what happens to Bible college. But theology is to be done in the context of the church. Because Apostle Paul wrote the Thessalonians, the Colossians, and the Philippians. Was it for Bible college students? Well, who, who was it for? The people in the community. Community, yeah. People in the church and Jesus and uh, Jesus and Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter and all of them said that the church is supposed to influence the community. Can you remember the second picture now? 
the Bible college is in between, inside, and from the teaching of the Bible college, which is supposed to be the first principles, the church community is affected, and as the church community is affected, it will affect the community where, in, where the church is placed. Can you see how it is supposed to be? So this concept is called church-based theological education. Church-based theological education. Are you able to get it? Which do you think is better? Seminary-based biblical education or church-based theological education? Which do you think is better? Church-based theological education. Why? More application-oriented. Yes, so it's not just head knowledge. It is on practically living life and seeing how uh, Christ can affect how we uh, deal with people and how things. So it's, it's more practical, uh, experiential rather than uh, uh, ideas. Exactly, exactly. So the whole concept would only make sense if I, just like the efficient Colossian believers, is in a church context, I can understand that what Paul is talking to me. Yes, you have another side of it where the theologians will become useful to us. The seminary theologians are good in one area. You know what is that area? We have a concept, uh, 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 a concept in theology called exegesis. I will write that down for you. Exegesis. And another word called um, uh, neutics. Okay. So you need uh, these two. Uh, these two. Uh, one second. All right. Uh, you see this book. If you don't have this, you need to have one copy of this by Gordon Fee. And this is a very good book. And all of us should read this as much as possible because this will kind of help you understand the concept of exegesis and eisegesis. Now. Um, I'm going to explain to you the word exegesis and eisegesis and you need to understand. After this, I will explain to you. So we finished church-based theology and seminary-based theology. Now I'm going to come to you the reason why seminary students are good. There is a place for seminary and primarily in the area of research uh, where they go into archaeological, exegetical and apologetic studies, which is good, which we don't have time as church for it. So they study and they teach us it's good. I'm not against it. So. We don't say no more, we want seminary. We, it's okay, people can go to seminary and study. But first principles, the basic biblical life and teaching should be in the context of church. Now let me explain to you, after exegesis and uh, uh, hermeneutics I explained to you, I will need to explain to you another concept, which I just now I forgot again, I'll, I'll, I'll recollect it back. Uh, so exegesis, let me explain to you the word exegesis, okay? Uh, when Apostle Paul, wrote the letter to the book to the Colossian church which year was it okay let's take uh, Thessalonian because we know approximately age okay yeah when Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church which year was it we I just told you 48 between 48 and 50 80 um, has Apostle Paul or the Colossian church ever seen an aeroplane at that time? No. Have they seen a mobile phone? No. Have they seen a book? No. Like, no. Have they seen printing material like this? No. No. Now look around in your room, find out what percentage of things would Apostle Paul or his contemporary Colossian church would have seen? If your wife is sitting next to you, that is possible. Uh, Apostle Paul would have also seen a woman uh, in her, his context. Other than that, about 90% of the things Apostle Paul or the Colossian church or the, uh, the Sloanian church or the, uh, or the, the would not have never seen, isn't it? Yes. So, when Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, there was a context. There was a context. So, the Apostle Paul was the original author, and the Thessalonian church was the original audience. 
and there was a context, a time, a geographical setting, a cultural setting, all of it was there. And when Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, his intention was in that context, in that culture. And the uh, original audience, Thessalonians also understood it in that context and culture, and they could understand Paul better what he was trying to say, because they were in the same context, isn't it? Now, if Apostle came, Paul came into this Bible study, he will be zapped to death. He will die on the spot. Why? Because for him, for one letter to go from where he was in Ephesians, I think Ephesus he was, he wanted a letter, so let's send a letter to Thessalonians. It would take about three months to four months. And here, I'm sitting with a room of about 30 people and teaching instantly. Apostle Paul is saying, man, if this was there in my time, it would have been amazing. But it, it, that was not in his time. And if he wrote in this context, the book, the letter to the Thessalonians would have been totally different, isn't it? So the original author and the original audience, in their context, the content was written in a context. Understanding that context and the intention of the original author and the condition of the original audience is that science is called exegesis, it's called exegetical studies, exegetical studies. It's good. Every believer in this room should have some knowledge in exegesis. For example, a simple principle, reading text in context. It's an exegetical principle. So we always practice reading text in context. Now, it is good to know what Paul, the original author, spoke to the original audience and good to know the context. Now, how do we know the context? I will give you an example. Okay, look this book. What does this book say? Sorry. New Illustrated Bible Manners and Customs. Okay? Now, when you read a book like this, or you read a book like this, these are all very heavy books, okay? Very, very, very big books. I can do bodybuilding actually. Okay? If you read books like this, you will get, because these are all scholars, these are all Bible college people, okay? This and then wrote these scholars will give you the context, the customs at that time, the culture at that time, and it will help you. Now, so the, we are all lazy people. We cannot do this. So what do you do? We have, we have readily chewed books, isn't it? These are all, I think you all have seen this book. Or you have, even more lazier idea is you have study Bibles. Study Bibles. So here we are all lazy. Somebody has done the exegesis. Somebody, okay, so now you all know exegesis. Let me explain to you the next thing. The original context and the original intention of the author and what uh, the original uh, situation of the original audience that we have understood. But we are sitting in 2020, somewhere in, uh, in April. How will we apply that principles? Because uh, we all agree the word of God is timeless. Good, but unfortunately it is set in a historical context. So we need to take the principles that were there and bring it into our context. Our context. That science is called hermeneutics. That science is called hermeneutics. So exegesis and hermeneutics is something every believer needs to know. Most of us who are lazy, we will just open the Bible one shot, Lord speak to me and read. But that's also okay. God is merciful, he will work in that. The little more lazier ones, we will use study Bibles. A little oh, more... Uh, yeah, some of us Google, yeah. Some of us really want to do a little more hard work, we will read commentaries. Some of us will say, no, I want to really work on it. I will read books like this where I will study the customs and practices. Okay? So, uh, uh, so you will be wondering where it's all coming from. So let me just show you. You can see, this is my simple library. Everywhere it is only books. So I will die again. Quite. Those, that big pile of books, if it falls on me, I think that will be the day I will be buried automatically. I don't have anything to worry about. 
I will go very deep into the earth. Okay. <clears throat> so when you um, when you use these tools, you can practice exegesis and hermeneutics, which will give you a good basis to understand and live the pr principles of Christ. Okay. So exegesis and hermeneutics, every believer should be able to uh, use, and it is fundamental to the Christian faith, and we need to use it because otherwise we will take things out of context and apply it into our cultural context and it may not make sense. And most of the denominations today are formed basically in the difference of exegesis and hermeneutics. In the difference of exegesis and hermeneutics. So you need to understand this concept of exegesis and hermeneutics and church-based theology um, and how the church is thinking. So that very important aspect is now that you know exegesis and hermeneutics, and you understand what is church-based theology, the best way to understand the whole, I bring this whole concept into one, one, one uh, uh, bowl, I would call it as uh, church is a hermeneutical community. Church is a hermeneutical community. That means when we study the scriptures, when we study the scriptures as a church, Hermeneutics automatically come out. Okay? When we study the scriptures together, we are in a culture, we are in a time frame. We are able to bring the principles from the Bible to become real. That's called church-based theology and church as a hermeneutical uh, body. Okay? So now I want you to come back to your page number 19. So the first and most important thing is uh, Jeff Reed says, you must study a particular passage. Now, I need to teach you one more concept before I go forward. Most of your uh, theological books, I don't know which one to take here. I will, uh, 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 most of your um, uh, discipleship books or discipleship manuals uh, are written in the context of what we call as systematic theology. Systematic theology. Okay. So I will give you one example for that. Okay. Uh, so this is a book. Systematic Theology and it's by Bain Gruden. Bain Gruden, okay? Now, this is a good book. I encourage all of you to get a copy of this. It's available in Indian edition. This is my, what I'm holding in my hand is an Indian edition. And is a brilliant author. He's still there. He's a contemporary. He's alive now also. Uh, he's one of the finest scholars in the world. Unlike most systematic theology, you look at systematic theology and say only this is for Pastor Charles. No, 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 it's not true. It is for all of us, okay? We can read. This guy has written it very, very simple. This guy has written it very simple. And it gives a brilliant, uh, you'll really enjoy writing, reading this. But there are also mad people. I'll show you one mad person. Okay, this is, again, Systematic Theology by Norman Gessler. I, I think some of you will know his name. He's a famous uh, apologist. 90% uh, of it will not understand anything. Absolutely nothing. So please don't go and buy books like this. Uh, this may be only for a little people who are a little more experienced in uh, exegetical and hermeneutics. But I encourage as many of you to have a copy of this, okay? But what's the problem with this particular uh, way of studying the Bible? So that's called systematic theology. The problem is systematic theology. Systematic, the systematic theology is not bad. It is good and it's worth studying. But uh, the problem with systematic theology is systematic theology is set in topics is set in topics. Okay, I want you to understand this. Systematic theology is a theology or a system of theology wherein which the theological inclination or emphasis determines the categories of the topics. Let me repeat that again for you. A systematic theology is a system of theology wherein which the topics discussed uh, is determined by the denominational emphasis or the denominational inclination. So, if you have a brethren or a Baptist guy 
write his systematic theology, he would place stress or emphasis in those areas where they are unique. Okay? So if you take this guy, he's a Pentecostal guy, evangelical Pentecostal guy, okay? Uh, this guy may be predominantly, uh, uh, maybe a little more uh, conservative fellow. So every uh, theological school or let's say understanding or denomination will have an emphasis or a stress. So when the, that denomination writes their systematic theology, the topics that they select, for example, you will never get a brethren Baptist guy writing on the tongues and uh, speaking in tongues. For them, that stopped with the in the AD, in the fourth century, when the Bible canon was formed, then no more we needed the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So there will be a stress in the way they write. So systematic theology has a problem. It is biased. Biased by the people who wrote it because they would have a particular theological emphasis. So Jeff Reed says that we should not be studying systematic theology but we must be studying what we call as biblical theology. Biblical theology. That means to say, you need to study the uh, theology by reading the scriptures as the apostles wrote it. As the apostles wrote it. Now let me show you something else. A very important uh, thing I want you to know. Uh, there is this book. I don't know if you have seen all this before. The books of the Bible. Okay. Uh, it is an, an IV version and there's something special about this Bible, I will tell you. Uh, in your regular Bible, you have what we have called as chapters, verses and uh, titles, chapter titles. Does your Bible have that? Correct. Now, the chapters and verses came in which year? Was it in the... Uh, just after Apostle Paul, or was it in the second, first century, second century? Was it in the third century? Which year did the uh, verses and chapters come into the Bible? Anybody here wants to tell? 16th century. Oh, fantastic. Oh, and that's excellent. It actually came in the 13th, 14th, 15th, somewhere in that range. Uh, exactly, I'm not... 15th, 16th century actually was the Reformation. It was a little before that, a little before that somebody felt that there should, in order to communicate the, to each other, to point out to a particular spot, it is easy to, if you have chapters and verses. So somebody says like this, I'm not sure of the, how authentic it is. He said that uh, most of the chapters and verses were put in by a person as he was riding a horse or maybe on a chariot, I'm not sure. Uh, so we are today stuck with chapter divisions and uh, uh, worst verses and also chapter titles, which actually changes the way we think. And there are so many examples I can give you wherein which your understanding has changed because the way they divided the chapters. In the original, uh, in the 13th, yes, Elijah, thank you. It was in the 13th uh, century, the 1200s, okay? Uh, Rohan, it was uh, not the 16th century. 16th century was known for the Reformation. Uh, so, uh, Jacob, good, good. You mean, good. You mean for the New Testament? Huh? You mean for the New Testament, is it? Uh, for the whole, the whole this thing. It, uh, Old Testament know, already had, right? Uh, the verses, I know, I'm not sure of it, but there's the, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, they said had uh, uh, the chapters and verses put in by in the 1200s. You can verify that uh, and get back to me. Ask Dr. Google, okay? But technically, the chapters... Now, in this Bible, in this Bible, in this Bible I have... The other thing about uh, the, our regular Bible is that uh, the chapter, the books are placed in a particular order. The logic of putting the books in a different, in, in a particular order is there. Uh, but in, the, in, in what these guys have done, uh, this is an IV actually. What they have done, they have placed it in chronological order. So for me, in this Bible, um, the Ephesians uh, comes after Ephesians. It is Philippians. It is Romans. So if you see the, the, the arrangement of books, the books inside this Bible, it is different from our regular Bible in that it is chronological. It is, it is written 
as the apostles wrote it. So it's kept in a chronology. Okay. Second is they don't have any chapters. They don't have any chapters. There are no verses in this Bible. Why did they do this? Because they wanted you to have biblical theology. Not to be influenced by the chapter breaks, not to be influenced by the uh, headings. Uh, they gave you the problem with we can't use this Bible. You know why? Because for us to communicate to each other, it's very difficult. This is good for, for your personal reading. As you read it, you will have theology flowing out. And that's the reason it is written like this. Okay. So now coming back to systematic and biblical theology, biblical theology is not topical. It is how the apostles wrote it. As you read it chronologically, as you read it in complete in chunks of text, you will understand why they wrote it. You will have theology coming out of it. Now, that is what he tries to follow. He follows what we call as biblical theology. That does not mean systematic theology is bad. You need to have primarily biblical theology. And then on top of that, you can have systematic theology. So coming back to your uh, text, coming back to your text, okay? Uh, somebody has put a chat one second. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So in the, in the text, he expects you to read a passage, not a single verse, not a single verse. He doesn't take several verses from different places on the gospel and put in one place. He gives you a passage to read. After you finish reading the passage, there is a set of questions for you to, um, there is a set of questions for you to discuss on in page number 20. There is a set of questions for you to discuss on the passage that you have read. Okay. So we as a church sit together, we discuss those questions. Okay. We discuss those questions on the text. Okay. And we work around it. Then from that, we write down the main teaching. We write down the main teaching of the We study the scriptures and then we write down the main teachings in that passage. All of us need to write down. There's a place for you to write down. I don't know if any of you are writing down in your in your books. You, you can see the way I have written down in my books. Okay, I have written down everything. I want all of you to see it. I have written down very clearly my thoughts because it says very clearly here, write down what you learn from the passage. If you do not write down, it's all in the air. It's all in the air. You need to write down, right? When the author says, write down the main teachings that is in the passage, after your discussion, you should have written it down. What we do is, among, when I teach people, I tell them, you read the whole chapter, write down what you thought after reading it and the, the questions that you thought about it. You write down your main. So you would have come right after writing it and coming in, okay? Then after you finish discussion of the question with the questions that they've given that there, and you have written down the main thoughts of that, then you have the next thing is look to the scholars or find out what the teachers think, page number 21. So what Jeffrey does is he gives his own view and then he gives the view of some theologian that he has picked up for specific reasons with regard to the topic. And these are very uh, very high-end scholars that he have pulled uh, in this. For example, in this, he has quoted C.H. Dodd is one of the, a very senior uh, theologian, okay? So he uses th two scholars. So the, 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 this particular uh, school actually believes that we have the Christian original text with us, the scripture, which is the first and the primary authority. We also have 2,000 years of literature of men of God, who have expounded and taught. So that's called wisdom literature, wisdom literature. So he uses both. He says, we have the text. We can look at what the scholars are telling. Now, when you have finished looking at the text, you have discussed as a church, you have done hermeneutics there as you study together. And he has given you some good questions to work with. And then you look at the scholars. Then you come to a place, what we call as thinking about the ideas thinking about uh, thinking through the issues you're thinking through what the text told the scripture text told what the scholars told what you all think about it right now and you will and, and to help you think through the ideas there is a set of questions there okay 
Again, you need to write down all what you think there. Then it comes in page 26, discuss the idea in your small group. Okay, so that is where the discussions happen. We are discussing. And the chapter ends with the last thing in page number 26, act on the principles. Act on the principles. So you looked at the scripture. As a church, you sat together and studied. You questioned it. You answered those questions. You discussed. Uh, one second, guys. I got an urgent call. Come in. One minute. So you, uh, you looked at the scriptures. You discussed it. You had questions that you had to answer. And you all discussed those questions together. You wrote down your ideas from the scripture. Then you looked at the scholars. After you looked at the scholars, then you all as a church, to get, first you sat together and alone in your house, you thought through the ideas. You came to the church and shared your ideas with your uh, colleagues. And you all discussed those ideas together. You came to certain clear principles. You came to certain clear principles. What do you do with the principles? Ah, feel very good. I love those principles. No, that's not what you do with it. You now decide what you are going to do with it. How are you going to act on, on the principles? For example, in this chapter, the gospel, you understood that the gospel had to be preached. The gospel has to be spoken. These all content has to be there in the gospel. And then now onwards, how are you going to do it? You're going to act on it. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to look at every opportunity. I'm going to share this content in the gospel. I'm going to act. So no learning. So if you look, go to the original understanding that the Great Commission said that you must be, teach, be, teach, uh, teach people. I think I will have to just this correct again. One second. Is the internet in this? My internet is going to go. So just one second. Hold on. Um, so uh, you need to, now that you got clear principles drawn out, and how did you get it? You read the Bible. You discussed as a church. You uh, the, then you looked at the scholars. By the way, as if you are very good as a facilitator, you can bring in many scholars. You can bring other scholars also and discuss. And then you come to clear cut understanding through thinking. All of you sat together and thought through clear, clear principles. Then you decide how you are going to change. And you need to now act on it. That what is, what is the Great Commission? Go preach the gospel, baptize them and teach them everything that Christ taught to obey. So without the last part, you will never fulfill the Great Commission. You need to decide, I'm going to act on my new things that I learned. So that's how your chapter ends. And then you come to the second chapter, that is baptism, okay? Same pattern, scripture, discussion on the scripture, scholars, thinking through the ideas, and action, act on the principle. Now, what do you understand here? In this chapter, you will probably understand that, hey, a person has uh, preached the gospel, he needs to be immediately taught about baptism and get them baptized and become part of the community. But till now, we were thinking, it's okay, he's now coming to church, praise the Lord, he's giving tithe, wonderful, hallelujah. And, you know, I'm happy he can play guitar, fantastic, he's playing guitar once in a while. But that's not discipleship. Discipleship is telling him, hey, the Bible says you must be baptized. So I have now come to action. I need, maybe if I'm not baptized, I need to get baptized. Second thing, anybody who's not baptized, we need to teach them what the Bible says about baptism and do that. So action plan. So like that, if you go, uh, there will be in your first book, Becoming a Disciple, you have the first chapter is gospel. Second chapter is baptism. Third chapter is the first principles, the fourth chapter is renewing your mind, the fifth chapter is uh, the way of the disciple, and the sixth chapter is, uh, what is your sixth chapter called? Making our lives new, making our lives new. You take the second uh, chapter book, uh, second book belonging to your family, families, take the sixth chapter, can you take the sixth chapter there in that book? It's called Changing Our Lives, Making Our Lives New. So all the six chapters. So every book, now the first book in the series, one is called Becoming a Disciple. It's got six chapters. The second book is called Belonging to a Family of Families. It's got six chapters. The first five chapters will teach you five different sets of principles. The sixth chapter is basically we sitting together as a church, praying and asking the Lord, Lord, we know now this is the truth. We want your help to practice this in our life. 
So the sixth chapter is basically a time where we are all as a church sitting before the Lord and praying and seeking the Lord that we, we think together very deeply about it. We write our thoughts down. We pray about that matter. We develop uh, our new belief system. We learn scripture by heart. Uh, we make clear choices. We make clear choices. No, Lord, I'm very clear. This is what I have to do. And then I make plans to follow those choices. And then through following those choices, I start to develop habits. That's the sixth chapter. Okay, if you don't do the last part of each chapter, act on the principles. And if you don't do the sixth chapter, Elam waste, all waste. Okay, I need you to understand every chapter, the last part, you need to finish it till the last. Last is act on the principles. And at the end of the book, the sixth chapter is the main part of the uh, book where your life is going to get affected and there that I want all of you to organize the sixth chapter is going to be a prayer meeting you have time to discuss think through make clear choices develop plans to form habits you write that all down then you sit and place it before the Lord all of you sit together and pray for each other pray Lord we want this area in our life to change these are the things that I learned Lord I want for change I want for change in that so without the sixth chapter nothing is going to happen. Without the sixth chapter, nothing is going to happen. So now I want you to look at uh, the sixth chapter. Turn to the page number 66. Page number 66. It's very, very critical what I'm going to say. I taught you how each chapters are made. Now I'm teaching you how the key chapter is the sixth chapter, the last chapter in all the books. If you see that first, it says, it says, change your heart. Change your heart. Or you can say, committing your heart. What do you do there? You reflect or think deeply. You have a personal journal or write down your thoughts. How many of you will have a personal journal? As you're going through the first five chapters, you are also having a personal journal. You're writing, Lord, you are speaking this to me. Lord, I'm convicted on this. I'm writing my journal. So I'm thinking very deeply. And then I'm praying also. So you can say, think deeply, write down your thoughts and pray. And with that, you are working on changing your heart. The heart is the center of life. And that's where you want the change to come. Then look at the next one change your mind or commit your mind you develop firm beliefs you develop clear firm correct beliefs and and how you how do you work with this you learn scripture by heart here you have memorization of scripture you will need to bring keep scripture in memory okay so that is an exercise we are all going to work on you need to, for example, for me to quote scriptures now becomes very easy because I have been studying Ephesians like anything, okay? I know now that the church is built upon uh, the apostles and prophets with Christ as the cornerstone like that. I can keep quoting scriptures from here and there. Why? Because now I have worked on memorizing these scriptures because I want to change my mind. I want to change my heart. I want to change my mind. And then the last part is change your life. I have changed my heart, I've changed my mind, and I need to change my life. How do I make my day? Now, based on the principles that I have journaled, and my thinking, my thoughts, which I have shared with my community, I have now, as individually and collectively as a church, we have formed clear beliefs. We have brought all scripture into mind. Now I have to make choices. I have to make choices. If I have to, and if I make choices, choices should not remain there. Ha, oh, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to develop a plan how I'm going to bring my choice into reality. And as I continuously make those choices and continuously follow up with my plan to bring those choices into reality, I form what is called a habit. I form what is called a habit. That is how the Great Commission is fulfilled. I am taught now to obey. Are you able to see what I'm saying? You are taught to obey. You are not for taught for increasing and tinkling your ears and tinkling your brains. There's no use in it. There is absolutely no use in it. So when you finish the first five chapters, 
you would have learned five different principles and the sixth time, sixth chapter is basically you sit together, summarize those principles, you think through those uh, principles, you have written down those principles, you are now praying over those principles, you're praying for one another. Then you, you have, because of those principles, you have developed very clear beliefs, you have learned scripture by heart. And then you have made clear choices. You have formed excellent, developed good, uh, developed good plans. And now you are in the business of developing a habit. Imagine you, who you, whom you are going to teach. Uh, you know, all of them are developing a habit of preaching the gospel. What will happen? Wow, a lot of people are hearing the gospel. Their their souls are saved from hell. They are going to experience the love and joy. They are going to worship my Lord Jesus Christ. We are praying for the nations to come to Christ. Let us start preaching the gospel. And this chapter is going to teach me how to preach the gospel. So my life has changed there. It is not like uh, pastor speaks fantastic message on preaching the gospel. Uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who, uh, you know, bring good news. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Benediction is over. Everybody goes home. Nothing is there. All of feet become as, as stinky as it was before. Nothing else happens. But here, what happens is we are trying to form habits. That means practice of the teaching that we start to follow. And then we, then what do we do? We want to teach somebody this. Okay. Now, you understood the philosophy of the chapter and the book. Now I'm going to take you through the philosophy of the uh, the framework that he has put. Okay, so he taught you. You come to your uh, uh, page number three in the list of contents. Come to page number three in the list of contents. I'm going to close. I know I've already overdone the time. Okay, can you see lesson number one? Are you all in the contents? In the lesson number one, it says the gospel message. What is the first thing you need to tell somebody? The gospel message. After you preach the gospel, you need, and if he receives, you need to baptize him, isn't it? You need to baptize him. And after you baptize him and you bring him into the community, you, he needs to know now that he has a curriculum to study. He has a clear curriculum to study. He needs to be aware of the fact that Hey, now we need to teach you something. So you introduce the first principles to him. Okay? But of course, you cannot teach the whole thing, but you're introducing the curriculum to him. And then you are telling him, as you study the first principles, you will renew your mind. You will renew your mind. Fourth chapter. Fourth chapter. And as you renew your mind, your way of life will change. The fifth chapter is the way of the disciple. Are you able to see? So you preach the gospel. Somebody gets baptized. You tell him now there is a curriculum that you have to learn. And as you learn the curriculum, your mind is going to be renewed and your life is going to change. Then the sixth chapter is basically you put all this into a mixie and mix it nicely. Okay? That's how the logic of the chapter is. Now, he finishes with the sixth chapter. All of that is set in his heart. He goes to the, we go to the next book, Belonging to a Family of Families. Now, a person who has come to salvation has got baptized. He is going to come in the church. So he needs to know what the church is about. So look at the first chapter. The first chapter is, church is the centerpiece of Christ's plan. So what is he going to learn there? He's going to know what the church is. And what, how important the church is in the plan of God. Very important thing. Very important chapter also. Then he, we are going to explain to him that the church is a family of families. Then we are going to explain to him the concept of a Christian family. The concept of a Christian family. And the fourth one is now... We are telling him, teaching him how to live in the church, live in the family of families. Why are we teaching him the Christian family before we teach him how to live in the uh, extended church family? Because the, the life in the individual family is similar to life in the extended family of the church. So unless you teach him how to live in a Christian family, you cannot teach him how to live in a church. It's related. And then finally, you are talking about making careful plans for our life. Now, that's a little strange topic, isn't it? But let me explain to you the logic. 
you have told him church now that he is saved he is baptized he is in the church and you are explaining to him that church is is the most significant thing in the plan of christ then you have explained to him that church is a family of families then you have explained to him what a christian family is then you explain to him how to I mean, uh, how to live in a uh, the church which is the family of god and the fifth thing is he says now because of the first four things you now cannot make your own choices that means you are making your own choices but your choices have to be aligned with with what the church is doing because now you are part of the church and you as a family are part of the church family so now as a family i am part of the individual family and this individual family is part of the family so every decision that i make has to be influenced by both my indiv individual family and my extended family can you believe it at this point when i was teaching in one of the groups one of the senior man there got up and said what are you telling me that now i need to make my decisions and i have to ask the pastor every time i said no i didn't mean that but you know where your church is going you know that you are part of the plan of god in being part of this church you know that you are part of a family and as a family you are committed to your family therefore your decisions are going to be affected by what your family is doing and therefore you are affected by what your church family is doing and therefore your plans will have to be in alignment your plans for your life is to be in alignment with your individual family as well as your church family that is simple that is normal can you believe it that chapter is going to actually cause a lot of problems in your church <laughs> all right now that you explained uh, the uh, the concept of the church it is important to know the church is on a mission the church is not in hawaii lying by the beach and sipping on nice uh, fruit juice no we are not there the church is always on a mission so everybody who is saved baptized you have introduced him to the curriculum that is going to learn for life you have told him that he needs to renew his mind this is all individual and that is way has to change then you told him that this is the church we are a family of family just like an individual family the church is a bigger family it is the plan of god all of those things that you have told him and then you are telling him the church is on a mission so the next book is going to teach him how to take part in the mission of the church how to take part in the mission of the church because the church is in a, is a missionary body the church is always on a mission the church is not lying by the beach sipping on fruit juice i want you to know this the church is not lying by the beach relaxed sitting sitting and having nice fruit juice in the sun under a nice sun umbrella no that's not what the church is church is militant church is a warfare body church is an action body church is a mission body church is on action so everybody who becomes part of that family automatically is enrolled enlisted into the army into the whole mission and therefore you need to teach him how to participate in the mission so the first chapter is helping you are teaching him how uh, you can achieve the mission globally how the universal church is bringing about the fulfillment of christ mission globally which is very important isn't it very very important then you are telling him how the local church is fulfilling its mission locally can you see that when these two concepts are given to him that the church universal is fulfilling the commission of great of, of christ and that that great commission is fulfilled locally by the local church then you now tell him now you being a member of this body you now individually have to participate in the mission so what do you teach him you are teaching him how to use every opportunity to preach the gospel so you see lesson number 3 using our opportunities third you are teaching him now that when he starts to preach the gospel people are going to attack him so he needs to defend the faith the fourth chapter the fifth chapter is a very beautiful chapter the fifth chapter is now that he knows how to preach the gospel uh, and he knows how to defend the faith he is now going to make his house as a mission base his house as a mission base so using your households to achieve christ mission so these five chapters makes him involved in the mission of the church he participates in the mission of the church you are explaining to him that the the global universal church is engaged 
in a mission to fulfill the Great Commission. You're telling him the same thing is happening locally. Then you're telling him now that we as a church are involved in mission, you individually have to be now involved in mission. That means now you take your second uh, book, last uh, fifth chapter, you said, you know, making uh, plans for your life. Now you see how your plans are now in alignment with the plans of the church. Very clearly. So now you teach him how to use every opportunity to defend his faith and how to use his house as a mission base. And the sixth chapter is getting all of it together, putting it in a mixie and nicely beating it and making it and bringing it. Okay. That is that. Then you come to the, now we have three, three books are over. First book is becoming a disciple. It's an individual thing. You preach the gospel, you're baptized, you're taught the curriculum or beginning to introduce the curriculum, you are taught to, that it will renew, to renew your mind, you need to way of life. Then you put all into a mixie and this thing. Then you are taught how to, what the church is and how you need to now be part of the church. Then, you, then the next book is how to participate in the mission of the church. So these three important aspects of the life of a believer is now going to be undergirded or supported. <clears throat> it is supported by the next chapter, which is called Cultivating Habits of the Heart. Cultivating Habits of the Heart. Okay? Cultivating Habits of the Heart. Now, let me look at the Cultivating Habits of the Heart. Okay? This is so critical for the other three to happen. If you don't build this, this particular chapter, other three will collapse. But if you are not teaching those three, and then you, if you teach this first, they will not understand it. Why you need these habits. So, letting Christ live in our hearts completely. That's the most important thing, okay? Why we need habits, cultivating, we need to cultivate habits. And the most important thing that we have in the terms of habit is that we let Christ live in us, in our hearts completely. Then developing personal habits. Developing family habits, family prayer, for example. Developing habits in the local church. Developing habits in your workplace. Does it make sense? Now, if you develop habit of preaching your gospel in your workplace, you normally you will automatically fulfill the participation in the church's mission. And then you bring this person whom you preach the gospel in your workplace to the church. You actually preach the gospel to him and you baptize him. All of the first three chapters he is able to fulfill because you have the habit of practicing uh, Christ in your workplace. Okay. So can you see how these habits, the most important thing is letting Christ live in your hearts completely. So you develop personal habits, you develop uh, family habits, you develop church habits, you develop workplace habits. Put everything into a mixie, beat it and drink it. So can you see the logic of the first book? Makes sense, isn't it? Okay, now I have a short q and I have overshot time uh, by, I think about 20 minutes. I'm very sorry, uh, but you have at least a little time to ask me questions. Uh, how many of you understood what I spoke today? Did it have a logical flow? Did it make sense? Did it make sense that through this curriculum we can fulfill the Great Commission? Uh, we can actually bring about life change in our own lives and in the lives of the people. Does it make sense? So when I am I am a professor in dentistry actually. I, I am used to teaching hundred students in a class. And usually when after a class I ask any questions and when nobody says anything, two things are there. One, everybody understood everything hundred percent, or nobody understood anything. So one of these options it has to be. <laughs> Okay, so ask me questions. You may have some questions or comments or areas of not clear clarity. Uh, Pastor, so yeah. when we do this, we don't follow any timeline. Um, uh, no problem. But as long as you are able to see that the last part of each chapter is properly done and the sixth chapter is a major Holy Spirit revival event for example when you come to the sixth chapter one of your carousel is fully dedicated to that first half an hour 45 minutes everybody is kind of sharing what their thoughts are and what the choices they have made what are the plans that they have made 
uh, what is their journals, what are the scriptures that they memorize. After that, you're going to get into a time of prayer. You're going to pray those scriptures. You're going to pray those changes into your life. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill us. Then we all be fully filled with the Spirit. Not whiskey, vodka, Holy Spirit. <laughs> So timeline is not an issue. Ideally, every uh, session should be two hours, but you can't finish it in two hours. You can do uh, one chapter in two days, like that. That is a, that's a flexible thing. It's a flexible thing. So I don't want you to goof up like I goofed up. What I did was I went in the speed of finishing the portion. What I did is I, I skipped the last two parts. I never thought through the ideas and acted on the principles. I only taught the scriptures and the scholars. I never did the sixth chapter. So all, I, am, I, I goofed up, so I call myself Pastor Goofy. And all my disciples also become Goofies. So don't become Pastor Goofy and don't make Goofies. Do the scripts, the tech, the, do the curriculum as it is supposed to, okay? You need to implement the last part of each chapter and the sixth, uh, and the sixth chapter you will see your church dramatically changing. I think some of the senior, senior most committed people in the new in the Whitefield uh, church is here in the, this thing. Uh, and if all of you were to practice this, teach this, I think the church will dramatically change. Dramatically change. You will influence your community. Any questions on curriculum? Any questions on the philosophy of the framework, philosophy of the teaching? the whole concept in the context of the apostolic teachings. Now, I talked about, I, talk, I talked almost uh, two hours now continuously, okay? I know that all of it is like, uh, you know, you make a puttu actually, you push it into that thing and you seal it and then you boil it. I know that is a little messy. It will sort out as time goes by. But I've given you the framework. 